How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name's Josh Hutchinson. Today, Binksy and I are continuing our series of divisional previews by discussing the Metropolitan Division. Let's hit the intro music. Banksy, how you doing, buddy? I'm amazing, dude. I'm like family wise having a great day. Uh, next week is the last week of my side job, so no more sixty hour work weeks for me. Yes. And the beginning of NHL camp, so there's like news and things of flutter. Like I'm so stoked, bro. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I I'm hoping that all of my information is up to date because I there I didn't necessarily check game day tweets very thoroughly. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that all these line combos that we're going to talk about are, are, are right up to date, but, uh, I mean, everything changes in training camp anyways. It's, it's like for a lot of people, it was media day. Like it wasn't even, wasn't even the first day of training camp. So, uh, there's a lot of just speculation. So, um, yeah, let's, let's jump right into it. Uh, we're going to discuss each team's performance last year, their outlook for this upcoming season. And we're going to highlight some key players and assess their value based on their ADPs. We'll also give you a potential sleeper and someone to punt for each team. And once again, starting in alphabetical order, we're going to start with the Carolina Hurricanes. That's actually, they were the best team in the Metro last year. And honestly, they likely will be again. Um, they were, they're a dominant team and they have been for a long time in terms of um, carrying play and shot and chance generation overall. They were second in Corsi 4 percentage, first in expected goals 4 percentage, and fifth in scoring chances 4 percentage in the league last year. Um, not uncommon for them. Uh, their 5v5 save percentage was was fifth in the league with nine four, uh, with a 9.14, uh, and they were actually 28th in 5v5 shooting percentage at 7.76. So there actually could be some positive regression in terms of their offense because that is unsustainably bad. Um, their power play was also not very good. It was 19.8%. They had a 19.8% conversion rate, which was 20th in the league. Um, they had a lowish shooting percentage uh, that could be attributed to a high shot attempt volume. Like their, their power play takes a lot of shots, kind of like, kind of, I mean, kind of like they do at 5v5, but they're not necessarily like uh, high danger shots or they're not getting the expected goals for or the scoring chances for. Um, and they actually, the previous year, converted better with tony d'angelo as their power play quarterback so we'll dive into that a little bit later um but that's a that is an important point um goalies let's talk some goalies here this is the weirdest goalie situation in the league probably um we got three guys freddie anderson auntie ranta Piotr kachekov um anderson had the most starts but they were it was pretty evenly distributed last year mostly due to injury um, but I mean, these are three very viable goalies. Anderson actually had the worst 5v5 save percentage of the three of them at a 908, which is actually quite bad. Um, he had 33 starts, struggled with injury, uh, and he has the, I mean, he's being drafted the highest at uh, 159.84 in fan tracks. And then Antti Ranta had 26 starts. He had a 925, so the best of the three at 5v5 save percentage. And Kachekov had a 913 in 23 starts so all very evenly distributed is it going to be that evenly distributed again it, it might be we don't know um kachetkov i believe is on a one-way deal so uh, they're either going to put someone on waivers or they're going to just run with three goalies which wouldn't really surprise me honestly uh i don't know who you who you would be willing to lose in that situation but are you drafting any of these guys i know you've been a big freddie anderson guy in the past um, are you still drafting him this year or are you kind of staying away just because of, um, I mean, the, the way that these, these starts are going to be shared? So the short answer to that is both. I have drafted quite a bit of Freddie Anderson in best ball formats because um, in the range of outcomes, him being the stalwart on the team is possible. And I'm willing right. to invest in that in, in a season long, like Roto format. But I've also shied away from doing that 
for a couple of reasons. One of them being Kochekov is on a one-way deal um, and the age of Anderson, right? Going to be 34 this coming season mm -hmm. and pretty routinely not hitting 50 games, right? So if he is fully healthy, I don't think he hits 60 games. If he's often injured, which it seems to be the case that his injuries have stacked and become really nagging, right? Like they're the same, same zones on his body, the same issues that keep popping up. So short answer, both. Yeah, fair. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to be drafting any of these guys. I think they're all super viable options on the waiver wire. I also am not super stoked about um, the counting stats for these guys. Team or they 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 have they control play for the most part so there's not a ton of shots against for these guys yeah. um obviously a really great defensive situation and most of them they'll get tons of wins uh their save percentage is going to be high but they're not necessarily making a ton of saves so um that's why i'm not as stoked about um having one of these guys on my roster um anderson i think is most likely to get the most of the starts i would say i think he would have been uh I, I don't think it would have been a situation if it weren't for his injury issues last year. I think he was the starting goaltender. Um, he was the year before. And uh, I, I just think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that Kachekov is emerging and that is interesting. Um, but, and, and then Ranta, I think it was surprising to a lot of people that they re signed him just because. I, I think it would have made sense to have an Anderson Kachekov tandem, but um, they wanted that insurance with Ranta and he's been really solid. So um, yeah, I mean, any of these guys are good options in the round draft pick, but uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm super excited about drafting any of these guys just because of the way that they're probably going to share the net. Um, I'm, I'm that in accord with that. And then in furtherance to that, in reviewing the schedule, um, for our uh, division previews, 14 back-to-backs for Carolina, mm -hmm. third most in the league. So you're going to spread that out even further. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Absolutely excellent point. All right, let's let's uh, let's find some value here. Let's look at some line combos. So um, Daily Faceoff right now has Sebastian Ajo, Seth Jarvis, and Michael Bunting on the top line, which is interesting. Uh, and then we've got Svechnikov, Kock, and Yemi, Martin Natchez as the second line. Um, they've got Tara Vine and all the way down on the fourth line, which I'm not sure is going to happen there. I, I, I mean, we'll see about that. He, he is kind of falling out of favor, but, uh, the power play, this is the interesting one here. So, uh, I, I think their PP one is likely going to be Aho Svechnikov Natchez. They had Nason last year as their fourth forward. I don't think that's going to happen this year. I think Seth Jarvis is going to sneak into that spot. They had him playing there in the playoffs. And, and I, I almost think that they're leaning towards that um, going into next season. Just the fact, looking at their power play numbers and looking at, at the, how they didn't really convert a ton, um, it seems like the Tony D'Angelo signing makes a little bit more sense. Um if they're not as confident in Brent Burns being the power play quarterback, obviously he had uh, he had pretty good power play production last year. I don't think he was necessarily the issue, but with Tony D'Angelo, like I mentioned, they were a better power play, not spectacularly better, not like drastically, but they were better. So um, I wonder if they're trying to go back to something that worked a little bit better and maybe D'Angelo gets some time on that top power play. I think it's a little more up in the air than people are, uh, people are thinking right now. So um, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, that's how I think it's going to shake out. Um, I could be wrong. Obviously, Rod Brindamore likes to shuffle things up. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably how things are going to go. What do you think, Binksy? I think there's a chance of being that being true that, that Tony D manages to supplant in a, even a nominal way Brent Burns on, on Power Play 1. I think it's more likely that he eats up burns minutes in, in even strength, right? Like their six defensemen are so, so, so strong. And 
the way that they roll lines in Carolina, I think that that's going to transfer to all of the depth that they have at defense. I think they're more likely, and this is just my gut feeling, I think they're more likely to stick with Burns on that power play one, and you'll see that kind of flesh out in a more even distribution on power play one and power play two, and a more even distribution in 5v5 for the defenseman rather than like a, a noteworthy kind of swap between Tony D and Brent Burns. But, you know, as you alluded to, that's they had success with Tony D and they didn't bring him back on accident to a stack decor, right? Like yeah. there's a lot of defensemen there and they made a real concerted effort multiple times to bring him back into the fold. So you know, like you said, there's there's a lot up in the air there, but I think I think the most likely thing for me to happen is that they they do curtail Burns' minutes a little bit, but it's not necessarily taking him off the top power play or shortening his time on the power play. All right, let's find some value with the skaters by looking at some ADPs. So Andre Svechnikov uh, is getting drafted first out of all these players. Um, Nate's got him for 33 goals, 74 points, 270 shots, 186 hits. He's a cat's monster. Blake's got him for 33 goals as well, 77 points, 278 shots, 178 hits. His ADP is 50.37. This is a guy that's got endless upside, um, but is really his upside is really curbed by the way that they roll lines in Carolina and the fact that they just don't always put him on the top line or top power play. Um, I hope that they do this year. We'll see. Um, but coming off an injury, I think Svechnikov is going to be good to go. I think he's going to be fired up and I mean, hopefully he'll have a career year ADP a little bit lower than it normally is. So, um, I think there's probably a little bit of value there, but it's not, it's not far off from where I think you should be taking Svechnikov, uh, Sebastian Ajo, uh, Nate's got him for 39 goals, 84 points. Blake's got him for 41 and 87. This is steady Eddie. He's getting drafted right around where Svechnikov is at 52.3 in fan tracks. Um, yeah, I mean, I've said my piece on Aho. I think you're higher on him than I am. Um, he just doesn't excite me a ton. And I, I, I tend to, I tend to pick, um, other, just other guys with higher upside in this range. Um, and I, I mean, the fact that he's a center only getting picked in, uh, in this area, it's typically where I'm fading center. So, um, it's unusual for me to, to find him on my roster, but I mean, he, he's, pretty much guaranteed to get you like point per game or a little bit more. So um, not, not a bad pick there. Martin Natchez, uh, Nate's got him for 25 goals, 68 points. Blake's got him for 26, 74. His ADP is 96.06. I mean, not bad for Natchez, not bad at all. Um, he had a bit of a breakout year last year, um, kind of what we were expecting the year before. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably better options uh, at that ADP. I think there's some other gems, but he's not 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 the worst pick. Uh, Brent Burns, uh, Nate's got him for 15 goals, 59 points. Blake's got him for 18 and 62. His ADP is 73.31. Uh, like I said, I I just I'm I'm not really sold on him being their power play one guy. I think he's going to still be productive. Um, he's he's not really showing any signs of slowing down with age, but. I mean, I'm not, I'm not as stoked on Brent Burns as I was last year. Then Seth Jarvis, Nate's got him for 26 and 53. Blake's got him for 27 goals, 59 points. His ADP is 199.27. That's great value for Seth Jarvis. I think. I think he's probably going to pop this year. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, you, you've got some notes here on Jarvis. I'll let you talk about them in a minute. Uh, but we'll go to Tony D'Angelo. Nate's got him for 11 goals, 45 points. Blake's got him for 12 goals, 49 points. ADP is 173.75. Also, I mean, if D'Angelo gets PP one time, that's fantastic value for Tony D'Angelo. Um, and he could he could break through those point totals as well. He, he did it before in Carolina. Uh, and then you got a couple other guys. I won't go into their projections, but Michael Bunting, uh, his ADP is 235. Tara Vinen is 219. Um I mean, their spot in the lineup is kind of up in the air. They're probably just going to play mostly 5v5 minutes, probably PP2. Um, but both those guys are probably potentially rosterable as well at the bottom of your roster, maybe streaming candidates. So um, I don't know, man. What do, you, what do you think about value here? I think I think uh, 
I mean, there's a few guys. I, I I'm pretty excited about Seth Jarvis uh, and then Tony D'Angelo. I think there's a there's pretty good potential for him too, as I mentioned before. So um, why don't you dive in here? Uh, I just think as far as like super value, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think D'Angelo and Jarvis represent a massive amount of value. We talked about the possibility of Tony D getting getting more or significant power play time, uh, and we talked about the possibility of being a Jarvis being a top line player and his success at that. Right. So um, I think there's a few players that represent significant value in this, in this uh, team for me. And, and they top that list. I'm most excited about Jarvis because that ADP is almost 200. And, you know, there's, there's a few question marks about how they're going to work the top six, but um, noteworthy from a recent reading today and somewhere on, on Dauber, uh, 64% of Ajo's 5v5 v was with Jarvis last year compared to 30% for Natchez. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen a slight dip in Jarvis over the last two seasons. He had 40 points in 68 games two seasons ago, then 39 points in 82 games. So a little bit of a dip, but the usage was still there. It, bumped up during the playoffs although that sidebar kind of confuses me a bit because he got more time but they also really struggled to score at points in the playoffs even you know as the as the metrics would bear out with expected goals and the and the course before like they were constantly in the offensive zone but really having trouble scoring so uh, i wonder how that changes possibly a d'angelo type switch right maybe they really lean into Svechnikov, which is what people like absolutely expect year after year. But what stands out most to me is that Svechnikov has been incredibly consistent in being the player that he is right now. And I kind of just believe him as a player that he is this player now, like for two years, we've been like, this is a breakout candidate and nothing really changes with the team and nothing really changes with his output. So I like him as a player, especially in a banger format, but the ADP of 50 kind of scares me off. Like that's even, even with the dearth of, of middle round talent at right wing like that, it kind of scares me off that people are continually betting on his upside. And I would rather, rather draft him at his floor, which is an excellent floor. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a great player. Yeah. I think he's a great fantasy asset. But drafting him at 50 seems seems really tightly high to me. And, you know, uh, Nate and Blake were talking about this in a recent pod. Like, there's a certain part of your draft where you're drafting for floor. And there's a certain part of your draft where that transitions and you start drafting for ceiling. And that's that's it's not 50. Like, that's way, way too soon. So I feel yeah. way more comfortable drafting Aho of those two at the at the fifty range, uh, but like you mentioned, the the center only eligibility kind of knocks him down a peg for me as well. Like I really really love his consistency. I don't really love it at center only and at fifty two. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. value to be to be had and to be fleshed out for the Canes, but I think I'm going to let other people overpay for the for the top talent and. And really go to town on the top, like the bottom two to three players on this team where they have immense, immense value. Yeah, I definitely agree with the sentiment on Svetch. I think I, but I think I do prefer him over Aho at that range. Um, for the same reason that you mentioned, though, for that safe floor, that really nice floor, uh, and the category coverage. I like that a lot too. Um, of our, uh, my, my punt is Brent Burns, uh, for the reasons that I already mentioned. Uh, last year, uh, I, I just think there's, I just think there's a lot of other defensemen in that range around 73 where you could be that are more solidified in their spot. Um, and then last year we said Max Pacioretty that ended up being right. I think I was concerned about him coming back, his timeline being a little bit too soon. And then he came back even sooner and then obviously got hurt again. So, um, sage, sage advice. Yeah. So it ended up being exactly the way we predicted. Uh, and then my sleeper, Seth Jarvis, for the same reasons that we mentioned before. I think the power play time is going to be really important. So if he gets on that top power play, that's going to be huge for him. Uh, last year, we also said Jarvis. And uh, I mean, I don't think we were really right about that. I think we expected him to pop a little bit more. But so did uh, many people. 
Uh, all right, Columbus Blue Jackets. Let's jump into it. They were really bad last year, eighth in the Metro, uh, injured more than pretty much anyone uh, other than maybe the Montreal last year. Um, I'm going to just not even talk about their last year numbers because I don't think they're relevant at all. Um, I, they were super, super injured. Um, they're, they were 30th and 5v5 save percentage, 30th and shooting percentage. Uh, their power play was 26th uh and with the 28th power play shooting percentage so all these things i think are going to they're, they're going to look completely different this year absolutely different uh elvis merzlikens i think is probably going to be a volume starter uh although he had an 884 save percentage 5v5 last year in 27 starts he was pretty injured uh had a lot of things going on um so i expect him to bounce back i don't think he's that type of goalie i don't think he's going to fall off the planet like that but his adp 201.55 in fan tracks. I think this is a really good zero G candidate just because people are really low on him. Uh, but I think he's going to have a bounce back season. Uh, do I have any reason for believing that? No, uh, but it's goalies, right? Uh, just, just bet on Columbus being a little bit better and him getting, being the volume starter. Uh, but then they also have Daniil Tarasov who was a 900 at five five last year. So a little bit better, still not great. In 16 starts, uh, I mean, he's a highly touted prospect and it'll back up Merzlikens. So there is potential there for for there to be a shift if Merzlikens is terrible again. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, Tarasov wasn't that much better. And I'm not sure that he's completely ready to be to be an NHL starter. But uh, uh, definitely there's a lot of people high on his upside. So um, there is definitely potential there for for a, a zero G situation for Tarasov too. So um, uh, what do you think? Are you, are you drafting Merzlikens anywhere? I am not drafting Merzlikens. I don't, um, I don't believe in three to four seasons ago, Elvis being who he is. And they have the fourth most uh, back to backs in the league. So I think that he is going to leak time to Tarasov whether or not Tarasov deserves it. And given the size of Tarasov, um, the fact that he was drafted um, in the third round by Columbus six years ago now, he is still only 23, but he's got enough minors experience that I feel like he's he's ready for that, for that breakout level as a young goalie. So it wouldn't it wouldn't be something that makes a hot take for me because I just don't know enough about Daniil Tarasov to, to like lean out over the ledge like that. But it wouldn't shock me if this became a very even split very quickly. Um, like the, you know, you, you mentioned how much better this team should be based on, on health and, and the defensemen that they brought in. And if things go south for Elvis quickly and we, he has absolutely shown that that is possible, that it could very quickly become a one, a one B situation that we did not expect with Tara soft leading it. Like I think really all it will take is a cold streak and a hot streak. And we're looking at reversed roles and I'm just not, not betting my zero G candidacy on Elvis Merzlikens. And that's, it's a little bit of more emotional, response to Elvis than than anything else but uh, I don't believe him as a player and they aren't good enough as a team to push him through it so man I'm not I'm not in on Merzlikens at all I am drafting him I, I I don't know that I'm super stoked about it but it's in in leagues where I've gone like really really heavy zero G um but I, I mean, just on the just on the idea that he's a volume starter on a team that I think is going to be a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not confident about it. So maybe that's maybe that's not what you want to do, and I wouldn't blame you for that. Um, there are lines on daily faceoff: Goudreau, Jenner, Line A. That was a line that worked at times last year. Um, I think that that's likely to to be happening again. Um, Kent Johnson, Adam Fantilli, Kirill Marchenko. That is a fun ass line. That mm -hmm. is going to be a lot of fun to watch. This team's going to be a lot of fun to watch in general. They have so much young talent. Uh, and then their top power play on daily face off. This is interesting. They have Gaudreau, Line A, Marchenko, Orensky, and Fantilli 
Uh, a lot of people in the fantasy hockey community feel like Boone Jenner is going to get on that top power play, but it would be very interesting if it's Fantilli instead of Jenner. Um, obviously, that would hurt a lot of Jenner's production. It would make Blake very sad. Um, but I mean, <laughs> I think that would be. Laugh? I think that would be a lot of. <laughs> I think it'd be a lot of fun. I think that would be really cool. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think Jenner is probably probably still going to get some power play time there. So I don't think there's too much to worry about that. Um, all right, let's, let's find some value with these skaters. Uh, Patrick line. Nate's got him for 31 goals, 80 points. Blake's got him for 37 goals, 79 points. He's a guy that struggled with injury. So that's probably why you're still going to be getting him around. Well, his ADP at 69.36. That's pretty nice. Um, so yeah, I think there is some value with Patrick line. If you're, willing to bank on him not getting hurt um johnny goudreau so i i'll just talk about the elephant in the, in the room i talked last week about how if you're watching the video about how i don't have a metropolitan uh division jersey so the closest thing i i could get was this calgary flames johnny goudreau jersey because I, I knew we were going to be talking about him uh so that's what i'm wearing today <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Nate's got him for 30 goals, 80 points. Blake's got him for 29 goals, 83 points. ADP 60.76. He's a guy that does nothing peripherally, but a guy that's probably going to rack up a ton of points. I actually think his ceiling is high. Like, I actually think he could get much more than these projections. Um, just because, I mean, he he produced without anyone and was. Uh, 74 points in in 80 games i believe um on a team that had just an absolute dearth of talent last year because of injury mm -hmm. so i'm i i feel pretty good about johnny Gaudreau. i don't know i mean i'm still not he's still not the type of player that i'm reaching for uh but I, I, if he falls into my lap i think i'm pretty stoked about it uh, Zach Wierenski, Nate's got him for 20 goals, 64 points, 249 shots. Great for a defenseman. Blake's got him for 23 goals, 67 points, 259 shots. Just crazy production from a defenseman. This would be a breakout season for Zach Wierenski. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. ADP is 68.15. I think that is a bit of value for Zach Wierenski potentially there. Me um, too. Boone Jenner. Nate's got him for 30 goals, 57 points. Blake's got him for 33 and 60. Obviously a little more bullish because he loves his boy Boone. Uh, 271 shots Blake's got him for and 144 hits. Really nice Cats player. Uh, his ADP is 149.58, which I think that's really nice value for Boone Jenner. I think that he's being a little bit disrespected there. So um, maybe people are banking on the next guy, Adam Fantilli getting a little more ice time uh, and, and and eating into some of that Boone Jenner ice time. Uh, Nate's got him for 21 goals, 50 points. Blake's got him for 16 and 41. He's a rookie. We really don't know. Um, but his ADP is 219.85. I think he's a guy that's uh, worthy of taking a swing on with one of your last picks of the draft. I think this guy is going to be legit. I think he's going to be ready to go right off the bat. And if, like Daily Faceoff is saying... If he ends up getting on that top power play at any point, uh, he's going to see some pretty nice production, I think. Um, he showed out really well in the rookie tournament. Obviously, that doesn't really mean anything. He's playing against a bunch of guys that are not really in his league <laughs> talent-wise. But uh, yeah, I, I think Fantilli is, 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 a, is a potentially really nice value at that, at that position. And then Marchenko, uh, he's being drafted at 242.48. Um, and Ken Johnson at 232. Those are uh, other guys that are supposed to play in the top six. Um, it could be pretty nice value too. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, what are you thinking about about value here? I think Jenner, in my opinion, Jenner is probably the best value pick on this team based on where he's being drafted. Uh, Wierenski is up there too, but I think Jenner is, 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 uh, is a little ridiculous for him to be at 150 here. So it's it's hard for me to put my finger on what exactly is the best value here because as much as we don't forecast injury and we don't prognosticate based on injury, like all, all of these projections are on an assumed 82 games, right? And yep. 
I look at this list and I don't see one player that I think will actually hit 82 games, right? Like I'm not, I'm not going to concern myself with, with how likely they are to get injured, but just what we know about these players, especially recently, there's a lot of injury concern here. So I think it's, I think it's pure upside for me when I'm talking about value with these players. And I think that Johnny Gaudreau has the upside of a 90 plus point player and to get yeah. him at 60 just represents phenomenal value to me. Now, whether you want to go with line a at right wing versus Johnny at left wing, that's a, a totally conceivable argument. And I wouldn't argue with you if you were like, I'd rather have him at this wing versus him at this wing. I think they both have excellent upside to exceed their expected point total. The value over replacement player argument screams out Wierenski to me, like the ability to get a power play quarterback on what should be an excellent power play at defense, who's going to eat minutes for them as they should be a better team. I really, really love the value of Wierenski at 68. I wouldn't call Jenner at 149 disrespect because post 100, 110 is where I, I start taking pure centers yeah. and center only. That's true. Right. He is an excellent play there, especially in a category league that probably flip flops a little bit with the five or six other players in that, in that same range. If you're working points versus categories, he probably jumps from the bottom of the list to the top of the list for me, but mostly I have concern about his back right? Like this is a consistent flare up issue. And it's not, it's not a, will he, won't he it's, it's how much time, how much load are they going to put on his literal back? And <laughs> I have, con have concerns about that. So um, I don't know what to make of Fantilli being projected as the second line center. I guess it's because what they have at center behind him is Sean Corrali and, and Cole Sillinger and like Corrali can win faceoffs, right? But we don't know what Sillinger can do. And he also has a high draft pedigree. So I have a lot of questions about their center depth behind Jenner. And I have a few questions about, about Jenner's viability. Um, I think the absolute most value that you're going to get out of this team is probably Kent Johnson. And He's a heavy, heavy sleeper for me at, at ADP of 232. Like, this is the very end of your draft. But his time on ice rose every quarter, and quarter four had him seeing an average of over two shots per game and 220 on the power play. Um, so I see a lot of good signs there, and I think it's more likely that he is the second-line right wing than Marchenko. Like I like Marchenko as a player. I like his offensive prowess, but what he does really well is shoot the puck and not so much anything else, right? So I have a feeling that he'll get bumped down to the third line to be the offensive prowess for them. And my gut says that, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation on this, Texier? Oh, Texier? Texier. Yeah. Texier. Yeah, Texier. Um is back in the fold, right? And yep. we have seen we have seen flashes of him be offensively talented. So, you know, other than like the the clear top three players on this team, Line Gaudreau, Wierenski, like I, I have a few question marks about their viability, but they all seem to be right about where they should be ADP wise. Maybe Jenner a little bit low depending on your format, but I think there's massive value to be had in Kent Johnson if he gets a better chance and and seems to turn it on a little bit. All right. In terms of punts and sleepers, uh, I don't know that I'm really punting any of these guys uh, at their positions. Uh, last year, we said Jack Roslovic, and I think we were definitely right about that. He was kind of all over the place in the lineup. Uh, did get some opportunity, but there were a lot of people thinking that he was going to get that top line opportunity uh, at the start of last year. And I was just not, I just did not see that happening. Uh, and then a sleeper, my sleeper this year is Fantilli. I think, I think there is a chance for him to be, uh, to have a really solid rookie season. Um, and then last year we said Boone Jenner, uh, cause I think he was kind of the de facto top center. We were saying it, we were, we were 
saying, I think he's going to be top line, not Roslevic, not Cole Sillinger. Um, and it ended up happening. I mean, obviously had some injury issues, but uh, I mean, I digress. We don't need to get into that. We already talked about that, didn't we? Yes. Let's move on to the New Jersey Devils. Um, so New Jersey, they're going to be a good team, man. This team is strong. Um, I, I know you're not quite as high on, on them as most are, Binksy, uh, but I'm yeah. definitely high on the Devils. Um, they were second in the Metro last year. I think they're probably going to compete for first this year. Um, they were dominant, um, just like the Hurricanes, very similar stats in terms of uh, the way that they control the game in terms of shot and chance generation, fourth in Corsi four percentage, second in expected goals, four percentage, second in scoring chances, four percentage at five V five 13th in five V five save percentage at nine sixteen, and 16th in five V five shooting percentage. So actually very repeatable shooting percentage. Um, and I mean, maybe they could even see a, a bit of positive regression there. Um, their power play percentage was 13th in the league at 21.9, so not terrible. Um, but they were 16th in power play shooting percentage and then middle of the pack in shot and chance generation on the power play. So I, their power play has room to improve. And and honestly, if they get that figured out, they have so many weapons on that team, uh, they're going to be really, really scary. Um, in terms of their goalies, uh, they had Vitek Vanacek, who had a 59% start share. Um, and a 920 at 5v5, which was a pretty solid year for Vitek Banachek. Um, his ADP right now is 138.67. And then they brought Akira Schmid into the fold uh, a little bit more uh, closer to the end of the year once Mackenzie Blackwood was... Well, I mean, Mackenzie Blackwood was down off and on all season and was just bad. So um, Schmid kind of came into the fold and ended up starting some games in the playoffs. Uh, he had 14 starts and had a 924 5 v 5 save percentage. So kind of came out of nowhere there. And uh, his ADP is 224.58. So he is being drafted um, just really late in the draft. I think he is a pretty legitimate zero G target, at least as like your second or third goalie, probably preferably your third, because I think Banachek is probably going to get the run at the beginning. But there's definitely a world where Banachek doesn't play super well. I don't have a ton of faith in him as a goaltender. I more just like New Jersey as a team. Um, so I think there is a scenario where Akira Schmid could steal the 1A position on this team. Uh, what are your thoughts about the goaltending situation and how are, are you drafting these guys if you are at all? I really like both goalie options. Um, they've got 16 back-to-backs, which leads the league. There's going to be plenty of burn for both of them. They have 34 off night games uh, throughout the season, which is fourth most in the league. So you're going to see w- what that's indicative of to me is that their opponent is not worth like primetime TV, right? I'm assuming that not reviewing the schedule in detail, but that tends to be the case, right? Like the prime matchups aren't happening on off nights. Um, so that is, pushes my gut towards Schmid as a better option because I believe in his talent. There are a ton of back-to-backs, so he's going to get plenty of burn, and a ton of those back-to-backs are going to fall into off nights, right, where he's going to get a lesser opponent more than likely. So I like both goalies. I think it's going to be closer to an even split versus uh, almost 60-40 than it was last season, uh, at least between Vanacek and the backup. Um, So... I, I'm happy to draft either, but I've never been able to get VTech because he's going so much sooner than I want to draft a goalie. And Akira Schmid has been available for me in the end of drafts in all sorts of formats all over the place. And I have, well, I won't say invested heavily, but I've definitely, I've definitely invested in him for sure. All right. Well, let's talk about, well, okay. So the top six in New Jersey is pretty much solidified in my opinion. Uh, they've got Meyer, Heeshear, Mercer, and then Brat, Hughes, Toffoli. I think any combination of those guys um, is going to be really a really, really strong top six for New Jersey. Um, their power play one, Daily Faceup has them as Timo Meyer, Nico Heeshear, Jesper Brat, Jack Hughes, Dougie Hamilton. And I'm pretty confident that that's how it's going to look, um, which actually leaves a pretty solid second power play unit uh, with Toffoli, Mercer, Holtz. 
Andre Palat and Luke Hughes. That's a pretty solid backup unit there. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, they're, they're just, they're just going to be such a good team next year. Let, let, let's try and find some value uh, with, with some of these guys. So Jack Hughes, uh, Nate's got him projected for 46 goals, 107 points, 332 shots. Blake's got him for 45, 111, and 349 shots. Those are just elite numbers. Uh, any other category, he's not really going to be doing anything in. Doesn't hit, doesn't block. Uh, we'll get you power play points and hopefully more this year. Um, but his ADP is 9.1. I I like him at that spot. I think that's right around the spot you should be taking Jack Hughes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no complaints with that. I don't think you're necessarily getting value. But uh, that's right around where you should be taking Jack Hughes, at least in a points league. Uh, Timo Meyer, Nate's got him for 33 goals, 69 points. Blake's got him for 41 and 79. That's a pretty big discrepancy between the two of them. Uh, obviously, he gets sh- tons of shots, tons of hits. Maybe not as many as he did in San Jose when they were just riding the hell out of him. Um, but his ADP is 21.66. I think Nate has some reservations about um his production just because of him having to share the load in new jersey um so i i I would say nate probably doesn't doesn't feel that that that's that's a value spot for timo meyer um i think it's probably about right especially in a bangers cats actually in a Mm -hmm. bangers cats you're probably picking him a little higher than that um yeah but uh so so maybe that is pretty good value in a bangers cats but um yeah i i think that's reasonable for Timo Meyer. Nico Heischer, Nate's got him for 30 goals, 78 points. Blake's got him for 32 and 85. His ADP is 48.29. I don't mind Heischer here. Um, again, this is where this is around the area that Smash Naho is being taken, uh, mm-hmm. like I mentioned before. That's typically when I'm fading centers. So uh, I think if he falls to me uh, in this position and I don't have any centers and I'm not liking the wingers or defensemen, then maybe. Uh, maybe I'll take Heishier, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I th- I still think he's he's going to be really solid in terms of production. He'll be a point per game player for sure. Uh, Dougie Hamilton, love Dougie Hamilton. Nate's got him for eighteen goals, seventy one points, two hundred and seventy six shots. He's a shot monster on D, one of the best in the league. Blake's got him for twenty three and seventy five and two hundred and eighty one shots. ADP twenty nine point zero eight. I'm gonna go out and say that I think this is a great value spot for Dougie Hamilton. I think he is potentially a second round player uh, in fantasy, like a bona fide second round guy. And I think you're going to be pretty happy with him there. I think he's going to stay on that top power play. uh, And he just does so much in terms of offensive generation. Uh, I think he'll easily be in the mid seventies in points. He's just, I, I, I love Dougie Hamilton. I'm super high on him this year. Um, Jesper Bratt. Nate's got 29 goals, 79 points for Bratt. Blake's got him at 32 and 82. ADP 78.65. Uh, this is the soonest he's ever been drafted. I think he was a value pick last year. Uh, still, One, even though he kind yeah, of broke like, out a little bit the year before. 155 something like that yeah it was year. it was really yeah but this is more reasonable for Jesper Brad so I think I'm pretty comfortable with Brad at this range to fully Nate's got him for 31 and 61 Nate's got him for 28 goals 61 points so pretty similar projections his ADP is 90.3 uh I don't mind to fully here but I I think I probably prefer him a little bit later um just because he's not going to get that power play one time um dawson mercer nate's got him for 23 goals 54 points nate's got or blake's got him for 22 and 52 his adp is 163.12 i think this is pretty good value for mercer especially if you're i I can't remember if it's fan tracks or yahoo where he's dual eligible center right wing i think that he that's really good value for him uh if he's got right wing eligibility uh not so much if he's center only, but I, I, I am, uh, I'm pretty happy with Mercer in that range. I think he's got potential to really pop. 
And then Luke Hughes is the last guy I'll talk about. Nate's got him for 10 goals, 39 points. Blake's got him for nine goals and 41 points, all in his rookie season. Calder Trophy sleeper, maybe you could say, if Bedard gets hurt. Um, <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. He might might be in the, in the top three in terms of – he might get a nomination at the very least. Uh, but his ADP is 170.72. So I think that's probably worth uh, – you're probably – okay taking a swing on luke hughes in that range uh, i i think you might get some value with luke hughes but uh um who is your value pick mine is probably dawson mercer that that I think, that would be my choice so i mean i i think it has to be mercer right because uh hughes going right where you would expect him to he's not my choice but i think it's a fine choice at the the mm-hmm. end of the first round right timo meyer plus seven, minus seven, depending on your format, ADP of 21 in, in either direction, totally reasonable, right? Um, he's here an, an excellent call, but, you know, like you talked about with Ajo, there are a few different, very reliable center-only players that you're going to be drafting between 45 and 55, and he's not top of my list, nor do I really want a center right there. Like, I've really backed myself into a corner if if that's how I'm drafting in, in that round. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like you, I really like Dougie Hamilton at 29. There's other players that I really want at the 30 mark. Like if, if Darlene has passed me by in that area, as he is, is probably going to, I don't automatically go to Hamilton. I've seen other people do it. Like in a slew of picks, it is those two and maybe one other defenseman that go right in that area. And he's, he's not top of the list for me, but I, I might just be straight up wrong about that with my, with my devil's bias. Like there's, there's a lot to love with Dougie. So I think that's an, a, like totally approachable value. I think it's reasonable with Brat and Toffoli. I think you're having to draft them higher than I want to, especially Toffoli. Like, all that I that I can glean from his 90 ADP is that people are like, oh, he's on the wing with Hughes and we're going to get 70 points, right? We're just going to get 70 points. And at 90, that sounds like phenomenal value when just like you, I think it is way more likely that Mercer is the right wing to own on this team. And having having him at 163 seems phenomenal. Like to see yeah. Nate and Blake... <laughs> only project him for sub 55 points like seems seems a little bit crazy to me i've talked about this before with the doubles i don't really want to draft those high players at their adp i really want to get in on the second level of the team and i think brat is a phenomenal value at 78 and i think mercer is a way better value at 163 I like Luke Hughes. I love that he's paired with Marino. Marino is going to give him all of the chance in the world to to flourish on breakouts, to play an offensive defensive position. But at 170, there are a lot of other defensemen in that range that I would rather bet on, like Tony D, like uh, slightly later Klingberg. Like there's there's other opportunity for a possible breakout defenseman right there that I'm more interested in but that doesn't say anything negative about the team or about Luke Hughes. I just like, I like better players in different opportunities. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. Um, Yeah. Take a look at it this way. When you're talking about Mercer into Foley, um, I think they're going to get the exact same deployment other than on different, on different lines, five V five, but they're going to get line one or two power play two. Um, I think they're going to have pretty similar production and Mercer's ADP is 70 spots later than, than to Foley. So which is mind opinion, blowing to me. That's fantastic value. Fantastic. Um yeah, so my punt is to Foley. Like I I don't I don't I'm not down on to Foley. I think I'm still picking to Foley. I have in my best balls. Um but just maybe not at that ADP. Um so last year our our punt was Damon Severson and I think we were right about that. I I really thought that I felt strongly that Hamilton was going to get that power play uh, job back and, and sure enough he he very much did um and then sleeper luke hughes i i think uh that that's my opinion um i but i don't know maybe that's maybe that is kind of contrary to the 
the definition of sleeper just because everyone is so high on Luke Hughes, <laughs> like almost to a level where it's like maybe he's a little bit of an overrated prospect. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so maybe maybe that's not the right choice. I think Mercer Mercer is definitely uh, in the realm of of being a sleeper as well. But uh, last year we said I said yes for Brat, uh, and you said Andre Palat. So. Um, total opposite end of the spectrum outcomes there you were in spades right and i was in my defense he didn't play a lot but i was very wrong i doubt i disagreed with you to be honest um uh, but yeah it didn't didn't he's uh uh ended up being a bottom six guy on this team and that's probably where he should be honestly they have just so much talent all right going to a team with a little less offensive talent uh, the New York Islanders, they were fourth in the Metro last year, just snuck into the playoffs. Uh, I actually forgot, to be honest, until I was looking at these standings because they were out so quickly. <laughs> but uh, uh, they were middle of the pack to bottom half in, in all shot and chance generation. Um, like Corsi 4 percentage, expected goals 4 percentage, scoring chances 4 percentage. So pretty, pretty mediocre. Uh, third and 5v5 save percentage with a 930. Both their goalies are, are just great. Um, and then 15th in shooting percentage at 5v5 at 8.73. So pretty, I mean, not nothing. I don't see a lot of like positive regression coming for that for them at 5v5. But on the power play, they were the 30th best power play in the league at 15.8% conversion. But they had the 30, they were 31st in power play shooting percentage. And actually, in terms of scoring chances for, they were 10th in the league in, in power play scoring chances for. So I think there is going to be some significant positive regression coming from uh, for the Islanders on the power play. So, uh, I mean, that's unsustainably bad when you're generating that well. It's surprisingly well, actually, for a team that doesn't I'm really, have like... I'm really curious what are you gonna say? how... Yeah. I'm really curious how that um, that power play scoring chances for how that tracks um, with Horvat versus before he came into yep. town. Like, good point. Um, yeah, I'm really curious. I'll have to dive deeper into those splits to see how that data bears out. Yeah, for sure. I will too. Uh, goaltending Sorokin uh, had a 930 at 55 save percentage uh, and a 73 percent start share. His ADP is 64.43, one of the top goalies drafted. Um, and Simeon Varlamov, he's still around and had a 9.22 at 5v5 last year. Really, really strong performance from Varlamov. Uh, but Sorokin has kind of taken over as the volume starter. They kind of were a tandem for a little while for a couple of years. Uh, but Sorokin's really, really showed out and and has has been their, their volume starter now. Um are you taking him? Are you drafting Sorokin? He's getting drafted pretty high. So I I have a caveat to my answer, which is no, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you're you're never gonna get Sorokin with a zero G uh outlook on the draft. But I'll say two things. One, Varlamov got extended, right? They don't Nothing's going to change in their net for the foreseeable future, right? They made yeah. they made a lot of changes uh, with the skaters, but nothing is changing with the goalies. And their upcoming schedule has ten back to backs, which is the second lowest in the Eastern Conference, right? So they're not going to have to lean on Varlamov based on schedule, and they have the sixth least off night games in the league, right? So they're going to be playing at an even pace. They have a league average four weeks of one to two games and a league average six weeks of four to five games. So there's a lot of teams out there with variability that are going to go hot and cold based on schedule and travel. They're going to go hot and cold with tandems based on back to backs. And this isn't one of them like at all. So if you are going to invest in a goalie in a top flight goalie, please, please, please. I'm imploring you make it Sorokin. This is a phenomenal goalie who has zero reason for any of the schedule to eat into his play. And his backup is cemented as his backup, right? Like mm -hmm. there's, there's no flux on the team at all. So if you are out there and you're going to draft a hero goalie right out of the gate, make it Sorokin. 
All right, let's look at the skaters. So, um, on daily faceoff, we've got Oliver Wallstrom, Bo Horvat, Matty Barzell as the top line, Anders Lee, Brock Nelson, Kyle Palmieri as line two. And then you've got a couple other guys that may be somewhat fantasy relevant, maybe uh, Pierre Angball, JGP, and not really anyone else, unless you're looking for straight hits. If you want Cal Clutterbuck or Matt Martin or something like that. Uh, power play one. I think this is this. I don't think there's any other way to, for this to, to shake out. I think it's going to be Anders Lee, Matty Burzal, Bo Horvat, Noah Dobson, Brock Nelson. I think that's, that is, um, if they're loading up, that's, that's the best that they've got for sure. Um, it's what they rolled with, I think, for most of uh, the second half of the season after the Horvat trade. So, um, so it could be it could be the the group that was that was producing so well. So, um, all right, let's look for some value with these forwards. Brock Nelson. I mean, there's a ton of value on this team actually. Uh, mm-hmm. Brock Nelson, I think, is is uh, is maybe the best. Nate's got him projected for 36 goals, 75 points. Blake's got him for the exact same uh and his adp is 137.91 he's steady eddie man and this is a guy that just just scores goals and it has really nice production year after year uh and it seems pretty reproducible i really like brock nelson and i've actually um been taking him uh in leagues where i've been fading centers this is a really nice spot to get your second or third center and Brock Nelson's a great candidate to be one of those guys. And I think you're going to be really happy with him. Matty Barzell, Nate's got him for 21 goals, 76 points. Blake's got him for 23 and 81. His ADP is 146.57. I think that's pretty nice, uh, especially when he's dual eligible. Uh, I think he should be dual eligible at least at some point this year. Cause I think he's going to play a little more wing. Um, with Horvat in the fold. Uh, and speaking of Horvat, Bo Horvat, Nate's got him for 30 goals, 58 points. Blake, 27 goals, 53 points. Little lower on him, a little salty about the way that Horvat <laughs> left the building in Vancouver. Uh, his ADP is one. You think that's salt? You think uh, that salt I, flavoring uh, his projection a little bit? Uh, a little bit, or maybe realism. Okay. Maybe, maybe he's, all right. he's seen. He's seen uh, all that he needs to see from Horvat to make a, a lower projection there. But for a guy that's normally pretty bullish on everyone, uh, that's a little bit low, I think. Uh, but okay. his ADP is 113.68. He's he's one of the top guys being drafted on this team. Uh, actually, the top forward being drafted on this team. Uh, and I'm not sure that that is uh, the right way to go. I think Brock Nelson uh, brings a little more value than, than Bo Horvat. Uh, Noah Dobson. Nate's got him for 14 goals, 54 points. Blake's got him for 15 and 62. His ADP is 90.88. So the top skater being drafted on this team. Uh, man, I really like Noah Dobson, especially for potential power play production. I think there's a potential breakout offensively coming. Um, you're maybe not. It looks like uh, based on the notes you made, uh, you're not quite as high as as I am on him. But I, I'm feeling like his projection could potentially be a little bit closer to what Blake projected than what Nate has. Nate was a little less bullish. Uh, Anders Lee, Nate's got him for 30 goals, 51 points. Blake's got him for 32 and 53. His ADP is 195.61. Um, covers the categories pretty well. He's pretty steady year after year. Uh, doesn't blow you away, but I think he's a guy, I mean, probably a streamer, but a, a guy that you pretty much know is going gonna, is gonna to put up uh, put up a point uh, or I don't know, get you a little bit of production uh, off the waiver wire. Uh, and Pierre Engvall, you've got a, you, you added him on here. Um, I'm going to let you talk about Engvall because I have my own opinions uh, of Pierre Engvall just based on his time in Toronto. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think the best value, I think I mentioned it is, is Brock Nelson here. Uh, who are you feeling? So, I think the best value kind of hinges on what happens with Barzal and how they play him. Because if he becomes a right wing eligible player throughout the season based on usage and, and we can, there's a lot of questions at this point in the year, but 
we can pretty well expect him to play top line right wing minutes, right? Like they yeah. don't, they don't have much else and they're certainly not going to move Horvat around. They're not going to move Brock Nelson around. Like they, they have that top six center locked up. Right. So he pretty much has to play right wing. And if he plays right wing on your fantasy team and you can get him at 146 with a absolute floor of 70 points, I think that's phenomenal. Right. And yeah. that purely hinges on him being a right wing player. Like if, if you're drafting him at center, then, then fine. Right. Like that's totally fine at 146. But yeah, if you're getting a right wing of note at 146, that's absolute phenomenal value. 100%. 100%. I did make a few notes on Dobson and I think they tell two different stories and the more important one is offense, right? So I will note that Noah Dobson had a 27% decline in blocks per 60 compared to 21-22 and a 17% decline in hits per 60. Now, the other side of that coin, and I think the more important one for those of you drafting him at the 90 ADP and hoping for 50 to 60 points, he was down a full minute in time on ice, but up 40 seconds on the power play. So I think that they, throughout the process of last year, recognized that he is an offensive weapon, not... Mm -hmm who they need to be a defensive stalwart for them. Yeah. And that transition pushed throughout the season and he was viable in all sorts of categories and formats. And I still think that's going to be true in, in this coming season. I don't think he's just going to fall off a map on blocks and hits, but I do think it's noteworthy to notice with your draft format, what's more important to you, whether you want a player who's going to fill categories or fill up offensively and you get both from him. So great, but know that when you're going into this season, his style of play has changed a little bit. And I think it's an important line of demarcation, what your format is and what you want him to do for your team. But at 90, like that's, Excellent, excellent value for Noah Dobson. I'm all about it. I really like Anders Lee. He's super, super consistent, and he's almost always available. Like He's just like a perennial um, waiver wire candidate for us. But I think that, and you're so likely to rebuff me here, having watched him play in Toronto, but yeah. we're talking about a left wing who is 6'5", 220, with speed and is going to pass the 300 game threshold this year. Now, normally that's qualified as a 200 game threshold for wings, but you push that back with big players, right? And that prognostication. And he is that 6'5", 220 is massive at the wing, right? They just gave him a seven year deal for a fourth year player. That was a bottom six player. And they gave him seven years that has to say something. And your ADP for him, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nobody's drafting this dude. And the possibility that he is the top six left winger for them, top line, second line left winger for them, I think is pretty good. I don't think it's terrible. Yeah, I mean, if there's anywhere where he's going to play in the top six, it's probably here in Long Island. Um, and... I mean, you mentioned 6'5", 220, and skates like the wind. Yeah, it sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds really good. Um, doesn't use his his physicality whatsoever. Like, not even close. Uh, this is a guy that's big for nothing. Um, and, I mean, he was one of the more frustrating players to watch on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, I was always really high on him. Um, and just he just never... Could just never put it together. Really prone to bonehead plays too. Yeah. Like like one of one of those guys that's just like uh, makes just egregious errors. Um, so I'm not super stoked on him in terms of the seven year deal. Yeah, I believe that they believe in him, but I mean, Lou gives a seven year deal to every player on his team. So 
I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, I, I mean, okay. yeah, he'd give him, he'd give him a 20 year deal if he, if he could, but um, he tried that with Kovalchuk and it didn't really work out. Uh, okay. But uh, here's, here's the only argument I have to make. All right. You have to, you have to pay up to draft Wallstrom. You have to pay higher to draft Lee and Lee is a, excellent waiver wire guy and wallstrom is a phenomenal metrics player right but coming Mm -hmm. off an injury he's on a one-year contract they didn't even bring him back into the fold in what was it down to the wire playoff team right yeah so they were like nah we're good and daily faceoff has him slatted as line one right lee has thrived in line two I think there is a serious possibility that we have not seen the best of Pierre Engvall and that he is a line one player for them in what should be a positive regression season. Uh, yeah, I think it is possible. It's definitely possible. I just have my significant reservations. I'll, I'll I definitely. Thought you might. Yeah. I thought you might. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, my punt this year is Bo Horvat. It's not a complete punt. Um, but like I said, I'd rather have Nelson, who is being drafted considerably later than Horvat. I think his production is going to be better, just in general. So uh, last year, we said anyone not on PP1 was a was a punt, which I think is pretty safe. I think that kind of holds true this year, for sure. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of sleepers... Um, I I have I have Wallstrom and Paul Mary as watchless guys. Uh, I, I guess you would probably say Angball for the same reason, um, just because they're all potentially playing in the top six, but probably not on PP one. But maybe the next one up if if someone goes down with an injury. So so that's really, I mean, I don't think there's any real popping sleeper candidates on this team, um, and then. Uh, last year, we said Lee and Nelson uh, as sleeper candidates because their ADPs were both over 200. Uh, and I think Nelson ended up being a smash hit. Um, so, uh, yeah, do you have any other uh, any other points on, on on punts and sleepers for, for the Islanders? Or what do you think? No, we hit it. We underlined All right. it. All right, let's go. Uh, New York Rangers. Uh, they were third in the Metro last year. They were they were middle of the pack to bottom half, actually, in shot and chance generation. Um, they were sixth in 5v5 shooting percentage uh, at 9.15%. So actually, like, a little bit lucky in terms of shooting percentage as a team. And then 10th in save percentage, uh, which is actually a little bit lower than I would have expected, but at nine, uh, a 921 5v5 save percentage for them as a team. Uh, they were seventh in power play percentage at 24.1%. Really good power play there. Uh, their shooting percentage was middle of the pack, so pretty reproducible in terms of that production. Uh, and they have awesome power play shot and chance generation. So usually when your team shot and chance, uh, like Corsi 4 percentage and, and all that is kind of not great and then your power play is really good um that usually means you're a top heavy offensive team and the rangers are definitely that minnesota is the same um where their power play is really great in terms of generation but as a team they're not super great um the rangers are are, are in that category as well so let's look at the goalies um Shesterkin, i mean the goalie that's really the main <laughs> you don't really need to talk about about the second guy. Uh, Shesterkin had a seventy one percent start start share last year with Yarrow Halak. Um, short, short share. That's not. <laughs> that's not good. Don't that's be different sharing. Than, that's very different. That's different, very different than different. an RBS for sure. <laughs> don't want to be sharing charts. Uh, <laughs> uh, he had a nine twenty seven five v five save percentage. Uh, his ADP is 49.29, one of the top drafted goalies. Uh, and Jonathan Quick is his backup, who had an 897 5v5 save percentage. Uh, don't expect a ton from him other than just a start here and there. I think Shesterkin's start share is going to be really, really high this year. Um, so uh, how are you feeling about this goalie situation? Are you drafting... Shesterkin 
or are you passing? I'm I'm gonna guess based on your previous answer answer on Sorokin, you're probably passing on him personally. I am passing on him. I don't really want any part of this goalie room for completely opposite reasons. Um, of note, the Rangers have a league average 12 back to back, so right in line with everyone else. It's not gonna push Shistark in any specific direction. It wouldn't shock me if Quick had 12 to 15 starts throughout the season, like purely on a back to back. And then like maybe, maybe a start in like a heavy week, um, which the Rangers do have, they have a high seven weeks on the season with four to five games. So there's going to be a few weeks in there where he's going to get an extra start, but they have 33 off night games, which is fifth most in the league. Again, that leads me to believe that there's going to be, some opponents out there more often than not that aren't necessarily the best. Right. So yeah, nothing about this goalie room particularly piques my interest one way or the other. I believe in Igor is a goalie. I don't want to pay up to draft him. All right. Let's look at some uh, skaters here. The top six shakes out as Chris Kreider, Mika Zibanejad, Artemi Panarin, Vinny Trocek, Blake Wheeler, and then one of the young, the young bucks. Uh, Daily faceoff has Capo Caco, could be Lafreniere, could be Philip Hedl. Um, I mean, probably more likely Caco. I think he's he's gotten more of an opportunity in the top six than anyone else has. Um, but their power play, I think, is pretty solidified in terms of in terms of uh, the deployment. Well, actually, I'm not sure. We've got uh, Daily Faceoff as Chris Kreider, Blake Wheeler, Artemi Panarin, Mika Zibanejad, Adam Fox. Uh, I mean, Vinny Tro. I, I don't know. Man. There's there's a little bit of disrespect for Vinny Trocek going on, but I think Blake Wheeler probably is the better offensive option, unfortunately. I I, I really like Vinny Trocek. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think there's... Maybe a little bit, a little bit more question than I was thinking at first, but um, okay, let's find some value with these skaters. Mika Zibanejad, Nate's got him for thirty-eight goals, ninety-five points. Blake's got him for thirty-eight and ninety-five, exactly the same. They're right on the same page. His ADP is twenty-eight point one eight. I like that for Zibanejad. That's a nice spot for him. Panarin, Nate's got him for twenty-eight goals, one hundred and one points, which surprised me. Uh, Blake's got him for 29 goals, 96 points. Uh, his ADP is 39.06. Another guy that doesn't get yet a ton of peripherals, and in, including shots, but his power play points are, he's hes one of the better power play players in the league. So um, definitely gives him a little bit more value in category leagues. Um, and at 39, I think that's a pretty nice spot for, for Artemi Panarin. Chris Kreider, Nate's got him for 40 goals, 59 points. Blake's got him for 37 and 65. Gets the shots, gets hits. ADP 110.06. I like that for, for Chris Kreider. I think that's actually, that could potentially be a nice value spot for Chris Kreider. Uh, Adam Fox, Nate's got him for 15 goals, 75 points. Blake's got him for 13 and 81. His ADP is 38.55. I think that's right around the spot that you should be picking Adam Fox. Um, I know you're, you've are you been high on Fox in the past, but I'll, I'll get your opinion in a second. Uh, Vincent Trocek, Nate's got him for 25 goals, 61 points. Blake's got him for 29 and 66. Another guy he's really high on. Uh, lots of hits. Gets the shots as well. His ADP is 129.39, which, I mean, he's a guy that I, I'm interested in when I'm uh, in in situations where I faded centers uh, all the way to till these mid to late rounds, so I I, I like Trocheck there, um, but yeah, if he doesn't get power play one, that kind of really that really hurts his value. Um, Jacob Truba, there's a lot of fantasy relevant players on this team, uh, maybe not like huge bangers, but uh, guys that that could give you some value on your team. Truba, big bangers, cats guy. Uh, Nate's got him for seven goals, 31 points, tons of shots, tons of hits, tons of blocks. Blake's got him for 11 goals, 34 points, ADP 114.06. That's nice value for Truba, especially in Cats Leagues. Very nice value. Blake Wheeler, Nate's got him for 17 and 57. 
Blake's got him for 19 goals, 60 points, ADP 183.43. Not a bad spot for Blake Wheeler. I'm not high on him at all. I don't really like him. But uh, at that value, I mean, I mean, maybe you want to take a swing on someone that has higher upside because I think Blake Wheeler is probably a 50 to 60 point guy uh, at best. So, yeah, I mean you probably want to take a swing on somebody else at that point in the draft. Uh, mm-hmm. Philip Heedle is, is relevant as well. Nate's got him for 47 points. Blake's got him for 49. His ADP is in the 300. So not really being taken. He's a nice little streaming player. Um, and then K Andre Miller, another nice bangers cats guy. Nate's got him for nine goals, 37 points. Blake's got him for nine goals, 42 points. Gets the hits, gets the blocks, ADP 172.26. Nice late round uh D option there. So um I I'm uh I'm a fan of I'm a fan of Keandre Miller as well. Um you've got some notes on Capo Caco here. Um makes me think that maybe you're feeling he might be a value pick. My value pick is probably Chris Kreider. That's who I'm going with at 110. Uh, I think the potential for him to to pop and get near 40 goals, and then with the with the category coverage, I like him. I like him at 110 a lot, especially in a wing spot. So um, that's my pick. Who's your pick? I have to agree with Kreider. Like a sneaky amount of value at 110 for a player that also hits is virtually guaranteed to get 18 plus minutes on ice on a totally stacked power play in top line, right? Like Chris Kreider is, is just the, the like fountain of value on this team where players are being drafted, like right where they should be. So it's a little bit surprising for me to see Chris Kreider go there. Maybe it's him being left wing versus right wing. I'm not really sure about that. Maybe people have like a, a hangover from the, the regression from the, the like, absolute, yeah. the absolute just torrent of power play goals that he put on. Right. So um, I like Kreider as a player. I think he's like a sneaky, valuable player um, in any league that has a little bit of banger weight because he's going to give you virtually everything that you're looking for. So I think value kind of hinges on Kreider. Everyone else is right really where they should be. I think there's going to be a sneaky amount of value for Keandre Miller, but I don't think that he has a path to like extra minutes unless somebody gets injured. No. Right. Yeah, I think he I has think. the, I think he has the talent to run with that. If it happens, like if there is an injury throughout the season to Truba or to Fox, like I will be like with a bullhorn, go out and add, Keandre Miller go trade for Keandre Miller like I think he has all of the talent in the world I think he's gonna just absolutely stuff stats but there's a lot of veteran presence in front of him that's really gonna hinder that for him so um I like him as a play regardless um you know as I talked about before in the 170 mark there are other players that I want to bet on right but um I like Keandre Miller as a player a lot um I really do believe in Capocaco, though. Like, this is a second overall pedigree player. He passed the 200 game threshold last year. That kid line had varying degrees of success. And some weeks it was Caco. There was a game or three that it was Lafreniere. Most of the time, what really jumped out with the eye test was Philip Heedle, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that happens with a center right like he was driving the play most of the time but opportunity wise and it's not just because daily faceoff has him slotted as the right wing like there's no one else on this team short of 37 year old blake wheeler that is going to fight him for right wing minutes it's not going to be Kreider. it's not going to be panarin it's not going to be lafreniere right hedel is pretty much cemented as a second line center Lafreniere is what he is. Like he's going to have to supplant two all-star level players. And I just don't think that's going to happen. Plus I hate his face. So <laughs> for me, the opportunity cost for Capo Caco to be a top six right wing 
in the league on a top team in the league for a player drafted at 288 who should be crossing a significant threshold for young wingers with a high draft pedigree. I, I think that's just, that's just Boone city. Like I'm so excited about that. And like, I don't know how other people aren't just snatching him up over and over again at the end of drafts. I don't get it. I guess uh, the reason why I'm not snatching him up is because I've done that before and it's just not worked out for me, uh, even with opportunity. I just don't, I just haven't seen anything that excites me from, from Kako Kako, Kapo Kako. Like they, they've had, he's had moments where you're like, wow, I, I can really see the talent there, but I, I, I just don't, I'm not sold, which leads me to my punt. Uh, I said, maybe no one based on the value, but I said also maybe punt the idea of Lafreniere or Kako breaking out. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, there's really nice value on this, on this Rangers team. I don't think you're really going to um, be disappointed with where you're drafting any of these guys. Uh, last I year, feel I, said like, Lafre- I feel like 288 oh. is a punt. Like you're getting Kako at 288. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That could it's be a streamer like, player. It's a streamer player. We're, yeah. We're talking about a top line right winger at 288. And you're like, I don't believe, which is totally fair. But yeah. like, okay, cost you yeah. nothing. I don't know, man. I just don't. I, I, I just don't believe it. I, I, he, he occupied that spot a bunch of times last year and just didn't really. And I streamed him in. And it was like zero 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 on the stat line. I'm just uh, like, I don't know. I'm not uh, super stoked about it. I'm Maybe I'm just it now. I'm getting I'm just it hurt. Now. I'm you hurt. Got zero, you got donuts and you didn't like the taste of them. Okay, I got it. You hurt me. Um, <laughs> last last year we said Lafreniere, and that kind of holds true. Just a just a bust. And then sleepers. I mean, Vinny Tro, uh, if he gets on that top power play, I think that's a good, uh, that's a really nice spot for Trocek. I don't think there's any real, uh, I, can't I don't believe think there's that, any big sleepers. Dave Faceoff here. has a right wing shooter suddenly playing at the front of the net on the top power play. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, he's clearly, clearly a gunner on the second power play for this team. Like, He's 37. Yeah. Like, what What are we doing? Like, he's not. Oh, you're talking team. Wheeler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's I, not... I, I, I agree. I agree. I don't and, get uh, it. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Also, uh, the Rangers power play was really productive last year with Trocek on it. So, yeah. why would you fuck with a good thing, right? Um, so, yeah. Maybe it, that's the value at 130. Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is. I hope so. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers, they were seventh in the Metro last year. Uh, bottom third in the league in all shot and chance uh, generation. Uh, 27th <laughs> in 5v5 shooting percentage. So maybe there's some positive regression there. Um, and 18th in 5v5 save percentage at 914, which is actually higher than I thought. Uh, 32nd ranked power play, dead last. Uh, and 23rd in power play shooting percentage but basically dead last in all shot and chance generation on the power play in the league. So it honestly could have been worse. <laughs> like it, it was really, really bad. Um, Carter Hart had a 66% start share uh, and is being drafted at 182.65. So definitely a zero G candidate. He had a 922 at 5v5 save percentage. So pretty good year for Carter Hart, despite them being so bad. Felix Sandstrom is another goalie that's that's present for them. Uh, his 5v5 save percentage last year was 895. And Cal Peterson, who they brought in, actually surprisingly had a better 5v5 save percentage at 904. Uh, his overall uh, save percentage was, was I think, sub 900. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, he is, I don't know, a, a potential reclamation project for for the flyers uh and maybe an insurance piece in case carter hart gets uh you know incriminated uh because oh. of the alleged involvement and in, he's a lesser he's talk about, the forgotten name in that list absolutely so so uh i mean 
I'm I'm done speculating about that. We'll just wait and see what happens. Um, I don't want to talk Yang about people, uh, especially if we don't know who is involved. Um, but uh, are you drafting Carter Hart? So before doing a schedule breakdown, I would have just told you no, but they have 25 off game nights, the fifth least. They have the fewest weeks with one to two games and the fewest weeks with four to five games, right? So they are like like polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of their breakdown, except that they have a league average amount of back-to-backs. So, I mean, other than the talent level being like a clear echelon above for Carter Hart, there's a lot of questions, right? Not only do they have Sandstrom and Peterson, there's a fourth goalie, uh, Urson, who had a nice stretch last year with a total record of six and three, but yeah. got sent down. There's a possibility that he's in there as well. We have legal question marks about Hart. We have question marks about the depth. Like, no team is actually carrying four, four goalies into this season, right? So, mm, do do I love betting on Carter Hart as a, a zero to hero option? Yeah, I think it could be entirely possible, right? Like he's got the talent. He's going to take a barrage of shots on a bad team. So depending on your format, if you don't need him to win and you don't care about the, the goals against average, then if you're just hunting like just opportunity and rubber thrown at him, then yeah, I think it could work out for you but it's predicated on a lot of different things. So maybe not Hart. Like, uh, uh, okay, if you want to throw your last round flyer on him, but I don't love it. I'm not excited about it. All right, let's look at their skaters. They're a little more interesting than they were last year, that's for sure, with a couple guys coming off injury. Um, the top six shakes out on daily face up as Faraby, Frost, and Tippett as the top line. Lawton. Sean Couturier and Travis Konechny as line two. You've also got Cam Atkinson in there as an option, who I think is definitely a legitimate... Uh, I think he'll probably be in the top six. I, I, he has a good relationship with Tortorella from his time in Columbus, and uh, I, I, I think that he's he's going to get played more than, than people probably think, unless he's still kind of working through the injury. We, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, I mean, everything we're hearing is that both Couturier and Atkinson are healthy. So uh, their top power play unit, Daily Faceoff has Konechny, Couturier, Atkinson, Tippett, Cam York, which really isn't a terrible power play. Like, I think they might be better. I mean, they'll definitely be better than they were last year. It, you, you can't get much worse. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, there's some, there's definitely a little bit of value on this team. Um, and I don't think people are really paying that close attention to it. So Travis Konechny, first of all, easily the best skater on this team. Nate has him projected for 36 goals, 68 points, 250 shots and 85 hits. So he covers the cats pretty nicely. Uh, Blake's got him for 35 goals, 75 points. And then also the shots and hits, uh, his ADP is 64.05. So obviously much He's being drafted much sooner than he was last year, but for good reason. He's a right winger, so that's another reason why he's probably being drafted so high. And actually, I do kind of like him in this range. This is uh, I, I have drafted Konechny in a couple of my mocks and and uh, best balls, so um, I I don't mind him here. But I don't know that he's necessarily gonna he's necessarily giving you like huge value. I think he's he'll he'll probably be respectable for that ADP. Um, Owen Tippett, there's a huge drop off after that in terms of ADP. Uh, Owen Tippett, uh, his ADP is 133.33. Nate's got him for 27 goals, 52 points, 252 shots, 140 hits. Another guy that's going to cover those cats. Blake's got him for 30 goals, 59 points, and a ton of shots and hits. Um, a lot of people are talking about him being a breakout candidate. I I think I agree, um, but probably not a ton more than than what he did this year in terms of point production. Um, I think he was a healthy player on a team that was injured a lot and got rode 
near the end of the year. So got tons of playing time, tons of opportunity. I don't think he'll get as much this year just because of the bodies that are back in the fold. Um, so I, I mean, I, but I am still pretty high on Tippett and I really like him at 133. I think that's, that's really solid, especially with that category coverage. Um, Sean Couturier, Nate's got him for 26 goals, 58 points. Blake's got him for 25 and 57. His ADP is 207.95. I really like that for Couturier. Um, I think, obviously, it, it, it's scary to draft a guy that hasn't played in almost two years. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, you're not really having to give up a ton of draft capital for him. Uh, he's a center only. Um, so maybe you're not super stoked about that, but if you if you have a spot at the end of your draft for 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 another center, I think Couturier is a great option and probably a safer option than guys like Fantilli or uh, I mean rookies that you're you're maybe taking a bit more of a swing on. I think Couturier is pretty nice in this area, and if he gets hurt, just throw him on your IR or drop him. Like it's not a, not a huge deal. You're you're picking him up at the end of the draft. Uh, Cam York, um, everyone's talking about him being the the potential PV one quarterback. Nate's got him for seven goals, thirty eight points. Nate's got him for eight goals, forty two points. His ADP is two nineteen point three five. And then you also got Atkinson at two twenty nine and Frost at two sixty five, who could bring you a bit of value there. Uh, I think Atkinson also is a really really nice uh, value pick. Uh, so. I don't know, man. What are, you, what are you thinking in terms of value? I think my favorite is probably Couturier or Atkinson just because, I mean, they're right at the bottom and they've been really productive players in the past. You don't you don't have to give up anything for these guys. Yeah, I don't I don't really love any of it. Like we we briefly talked about this on a recent pod. Like the team is so bad that I'm not really looking their way, and the the diamonds in the rough. I will let lay in the rough, right? Like I'm, I'm really only excited about Konechny and the ADP of 64 is, is too high for me, even at right wing. Like, you know, Nate hasn't projected for 250 shots, Blake 272 shots. And in a brief review, career high 220 on a season where he shot 7.3%, right? So like the the middle ground for me is is probably above 200 shots given that that was in a 1737 average time on ice season and he's very much a, a 20 minutes on ice player but you know his career average is 12 in the shooting percentage and last last season was 16 with sub 200 shots in 60 games so I, I don't necessarily believe that even though he should be the shot driver on this team, that it's just going to naturally fall into place that way. And he's really the only player that I personally want to invest in. Like I am not so high on Atkinson that I care to draft him even at 229. I think the only player that really represents true value for me is Couturier and at 207, I have already drafted that center depth, right? Like, I think he is yeah. a fine center piece, uh, pardon the pun, but um, like, I'm, I'm already, I've already like leached all of the pure center value between 120 and 200 at that yeah. point. And if I haven't, then I really missed, right? So yep. maybe, maybe it's a solid draft strategy to to skip a couple of centers in those rounds and take some more power play one quarterback like lotto tickets uh maybe it's better to to go a little bit higher on your zero g list and and get couturier later like i don't think that's necessarily a bad strategy but it's not one that i've employed thus far all right in terms of punts i said cam york i'm just not super sold on him being uh being a a legitimate power play quarterback i i think uh, yeah i i i I, i'm uh i mean he doesn't do anything peripherally doesn't give you a ton of value i mean 
he's getting picked at the end of your draft. So, so you're really taking a swing on a guy that could, that it, it's looking like he's going to be a power player. So maybe, maybe that's uh maybe that's a bad pick, but uh, uh, there is some value on this team. So there's not a ton of punt options. If I had to pick, I'd probably pick him just because I think I'm probably at, at, at that point, I have all of my, all of my D figured out. So for the same reason that you talk, you talked about with Couturier, um, mm-hmm. And then uh, last year we said Provorov. That was definitely right. <laughs> uh, and then sleepers. Uh, I mean, I already talked about Kachuri and Atkinson at 200 plus. I think they're probably like wild cards, but I, I they ha- have pretty big upside just because of what they've done in the past. Um, pretty big, pretty big injury risks, but uh, I, I still, I still think that they could potentially be valuable. Uh, last year, I said Atkinson as well. That was obviously before uh, he it, they announced that he was out for the year because uh, his ADP last year was about the same, 210. Uh, and then Binksy, you said Konechny at 189. So so good on you for that. That was that was uh, that was the pick for them for sure. I don't, I don't think that makes me a, a crystal ball reader thinking that Konechny was going to be the the value play for Philadelphia last year. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. All right, let's talk about Pitt- Pittsburgh. I'm excited to talk about this team. So they were fifth in the Metro last year. They famously missed the playoffs uh, just based on multiple ridiculous gaffes at the end of the season, losing to Chicago in their last game uh, and allowing Florida to sneak in and go all the way to the Stanley Cup final. Just, just crazy, crazy story there. Uh, and that ended a huge streak of of playoff, uh, uh, of of making the playoffs for that team. They they um, had done it many many years in a row for almost Crosby's whole career, other than I believe his first season. Um, so they were ninth in the league in Corsi four percentage, fourth in expected goals for percentage, and twelfth in scoring chances for percentage as a team. So. Actually, pretty nice numbers uh, in those categories. Uh, they were fourth in 5v5 save percentage, or sorry, 14th in 5v5 save percentage at 916, and 31st in 5v5 shooting percentage at 7.61. So what do you think here? They generate a ton, and their shooting percentage is one of the worst in the league. Like, uh, it, it seems to me... Like there's probably some positive regression coming, but let's look at the power play. So they were the 14th ranked power play in the league at a 21.7% conversion. Uh, They were 12th in power play shooting percentage and they were top four in power play Corsi four percentage expected goals for, uh, or sorry, power play Corsi four expected goals for and scoring chances for. So really good power play. Um, may improve uh with eric carlson um and yeah they're at 5v5 there's only they're only going to get better and they i think i think that they're going to be better like they were healthy for the first time ever in this in this in this era of crosby malkin latang and their shooting percentage was 7.61 as a team like are you kidding me that's crazy um tristan jari uh, had a 57% start share last year, and that's with an injury. I think he would have been more of a volume starter last year if he wasn't hurt so much. Uh, but he had a 918 5v5 save percentage, um, and his ADP is 133.01. Got a huge contract. I think he's going to be a huge value or volume starter this year and could be a pretty nice option in 0G. Um, like, really nice, actually. Um, if you're If you're picking a little bit earlier... Uh, in terms of your zero G strategy, but um, Alex Nedeljkovic is the backup. And that's the main reason why I think you should be banking on Tristan Jari because uh, while he had a 913 five and five save percentage last year, he actually had an 895 save percentage overall and got relegated to the minors for a while last year, like similar to Cal Peterson um, was not good at all. So don't love that as their backup situation in Pittsburgh. It's, he's a downgrade from Casey to Smith. So uh, well, how exactly, how are you feeling about Tristan Jari? I'm pretty high on him going into next year and I'm pretty high on the penguins in general. 
I agree on both counts. I am very high on the Penguins going into this season, um, not just on conversion metrics, but on their kind of last ride, right? Like they have a lot of star players on the team and provided they're healthy, which we're just going to bank that they are. Uh, it should be a much better team in terms of uh, goals for versus goals against, right? So the hope is that they, including Jari, will all be healthier. And I'm willing to bet on that as a team and to a slightly lesser extent with Jari. I don't love drafting a goalie at 133, but immense value for what should be a starts eater, right? Like he very easily could get 60 plus percent of the starts like if if they go into it strong and they start hitting loss after loss with Nadelkovich, which wouldn't surprise anyone then it could really really get a heavy tilt very quickly so 133 scares me but at the same time when you're starting to consider zero g candidates in your draft whatever round that may be for you right yeah. we talk about about that applicable round all the time. It looks different every draft based on on value on the board. But in general, I think Jari is an excellent zero to hero candidate at 133, right? Like no competition. Team should be good. Team should be better in conversion. And he has the pedigree, has the history of being a successful goalie. He's locked into a contract. Like all the signs are positive um, kind of, looking with blinders versus injury on. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the skaters. So um, the line situation we've got, I mean, daily Faceoff has a really weird lineup. I don't think it's correct. <laughs> uh, Riley Smith and Sidney Crosby, Ricard Raquel as their top line. Although I guess with the Jake Gensel injury, they're factoring that in. So maybe, maybe that is the case to start the season for the first little while. Um, and then Alex Nylander, Evgeny Malik, and Brian Rust. Uh, Nylander did fill in in the top six at times due to injury, although there weren't many last year for the Penguins. Um, and then power play one. Daily faceoff has Raquel, Crosby, Malkin, Carlson, Latang. I mean, I listen to the Fantasy Hockey Life podcast. I know that Nate and Blake are both pretty high on this. Or, I mean, they're... They're feeling like this is how it's going to shake out. I mean, the beat writer that was talking, I can't remember who it was uh, on the Fantasy Hockey Life podcast with Victor Nuno and Jesse Sevier um, was talking about how they don't think that that's the way it's going to go. Like they think that Carlson's going to get the top power play time and they're going to give uh, Latang a bit of a rest and put him on power play too. So um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, I think there's a chance that there is a fourth forward on that power play or that they just try a bunch of different things. They have so many weapons. Uh, I don't think it's really going to matter who plays on that top power play. But uh, all right, let's uh, find some value in these skaters. Sidney Crosby, Nate's got him for 35 goals, 95 points. Nate's Blake's got him for 32 goals, 88 points. This team, I actually noticed in the projections, Blake is clearly lower on the Penguins than Nate is. Nate's pretty high on them. Uh, Nate's Blake's are, or Nate's, Oh my God. Uh, Nate's <laughs> Nate's projections are uh, much more bullish than Blake's, uh, which it's usually the other way around for the, but for this team, it's, it, it's not um, Crosby's ADP is 23.12. Um, that's decent value for Crosby. I think, I think that's probably right around uh, the correct place to be taking him. There's so many guys that are uh, that have the chance of, hitting a hundred points. Uh, I don't think he's quite there anymore. Um, so he's kind of in that second tier of players and he's also center only. So, um, but I think there is a, a scenario where he falls in my lap and, and I'm taking him, but it is probably late second round, like where his ADP is. Um, Jake Gensel. Um, Dubas has said he's only expected to miss five games, despite um, a lot of people being concerned about injury. Um, so that shouldn't affect where you take him in a draft. Um, he's only going to miss the first couple weeks. So Nate's got him for 39 goals, 84 points. Blake's got him for 38 and 78. Uh, his ADP is 41.02, which is considerably 
later than he's been getting picked the last couple of years. So I think that's actually pretty good value for Jake Gensel. Um, huge. I think there's a lot of injury concern and people are worried about that. Um, uh, but I think that's, that's great value for Gensel. Evgeny Malkin, Nate's got him for 29 goals, 84 points. Blake's got him for 31 and 81 ADP 77.15. Fantastic value for Malkin. I think that's, that's really, really good value. Um, Chris Letang, Nate's got him for 12 goals, 63 points. Blake's got him for 11 and 55. Now that is factoring in them thinking that he's going to be playing with Carlson on the top power play. I'm not as confident. His ADP is 92.81. There I'm still pretty okay with Letang. Uh, I think his 5v5 production is good enough. uh, And his peripherals are really nice. I think he's still going to play a ton. Um, so I, I, I do, I am pretty comfortable in the nineties to hundreds taking, taking Chris Letang, um, Eric Carlson, Nate's got him for 18 goals, 75 points. Blake's got him for 17 and 77. His ADP is 33.48. Again, I think that's reasonable for Carlson. I don't think I'm taking him really much earlier or later. Um, Ricard Raquel, Nate's got him for 26 goals, 56 points. He gets shots. He gets he gets uh, hits. Blake's got him for 26 goals, 53 points. His ADP is 115.95. Um, I mean, that's pretty good Pretty good value for Raquel, especially if he plays on power play one. I, I, I think uh, I think that's right around where you should be taking Raquel. Uh, Brian Rust. This is an interesting one. Nate's got him for 28 goals, 55 points. Blake's got him for 24 goals, 50 points. Uh, his ADP is 185. Point five one. We looked at the luck metrics when we were talking about positive regression candidates, and I was really feeling like he is going to have a bounce back season. Now, not getting power play one time is is going to hurt, but I still think that he is is going to come back and be a really solid uh, contributor uh, for the offense of this team. Uh, and playing with Malkin is is uh, that doesn't hurt either. Um, so, I like. Brian Rust at this position. I actually think this is going to be fantastic value for him. Uh, for a guy that two years ago uh, was at a point per game pace. Uh, so I'm not saying that he's that player, but I think he has the potential to to really outperform that ADP. And mm-hmm. uh, especially as a right winger, like that's, that's a really nice right wing candidate late in your draft. If you missed on right wingers earlier on, I think he's, he's a pretty good candidate there. Uh, and then Riley Smith, Nate's got him for 24 goals, 50 points. Blake's got him for 21 and 53. His ADP is 175.35. Going to play in the top six, not the top power play. That's about what you'd expect from from Smith. Uh, guy at the bottom of your lineup, maybe a streamer. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the best value here is Brian Rust. Um, there, obviously, there's a couple others. I think Malkin's got great value, and Gensel, like I mentioned, I think has has uh, some pretty good value. He's being drafted a little bit lower than maybe he should. Um, but yeah, uh, who are you feeling here, Binksy? There's not one player that we talked about that I'm not excited to have on a fantasy roster for a variety of different reasons, right? Like the ADPs for every one of these players are great. It seems like every draft that I'm in, I end up drafting Malkin because there's 90 point upside on what should be a better converting team post 70 in the draft. Like right when I'm like, okay, I'm going to start, start hammering on, on center only players. And Malkin is somehow always there. And I assume that's because people don't believe in his ability to stay healthy and not his actual ability to, to output points. So, you know, obviously there's always that concern, but I am absolutely elated to be getting Malkin plus 70 in every draft. Like it, I, I've almost like swayed away from it because my exposure is so high to Malkin at this point that I'm like, all right, well, I got to try something else in case this doesn't work out in the season. Right. Um, yep. For me, the the really the only question mark I have on this team surprisingly isn't Latang versus Carlson and how the power play percentage works out how who is the the dominant number one uh, defenseman on this team for me it's really how does Russ versus Raquel shake out right yeah. like 
the value is in rust because of the ADP being 70 spots later, but I think both players are viable. I think they're both going to get opportunity. I think they both had streets of success. And for me, I just kind of intrinsically believe in rust more. So I'm more excited to get him at 185 versus Raquel at 115. But I honestly, I think I'm happy with, with either player on my roster and throughout this discussion about the penguins, I'm tempted to just go into a draft and take both because either one of them could work out. And when they work out, that is absolutely a a position that I want to be in having the best right wing on the penguins when they start converting like they should. Right. Like history says to me, rust is more likely to be that player. And, and Raquel is more likely to be the middle six right wing doing other things on the team versus point production. But you know, there's no guarantees and I don't know. I, I, like he he's down on our our list as a sleeper, but can you even call Brian Rust a sleeper? Yeah, yeah. If he's done, if he had just had a down year last year, I guess a bounce back candidate more than a sleeper. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great point about the Raquel Rust conversation. I think that there is potential for him to maybe to maybe pop up on the Crosby line again with with Gensel. Um, and uh, that would be great for him. They have built-in chemistry. They've done it before. He kind of slipped down the lineup just because he was struggling last year. So um, it could flip-flop very easily. And uh, yeah, I guess in in that case, because of the ADPs, maybe maybe I would punt Raquel a little bit. Um, I didn't initially have anyone on my punt list, but but maybe. Uh, maybe i mean yeah i think i think maybe i'm i'm changing my mind a little bit i i i mean rust is very comparable in terms of category coverage too like obviously doesn't yeah. shoot and hit as much but he does like he does he's still he's still about to hit a game and and he shoots over 200 shots uh 200 shot pace per year raquel is a little bit more uh more like 220 and and 130 in terms of hits but uh yeah i i, I like uh, yeah, it's it's a good uh, a good situation to talk about. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about about that that right wing situation, but I think I think it's a fair discussion to have. All okay, right, let's so, move on. Oh, sorry, sorry. You keep you keep going. Re- really quickly before we move on into Washington and and wrapping up, this is the constant debate right now in in the Discord. Are you drafting Carlson at thirty three? Are you drafting Latang at 92 or are you drafting neither? Oh, I think I'm going Carlson at 33. Really? Um, I think, yeah, I think he has a uh, really nice value. I think he's definitely going to get the top power play. Like, I don't think there's a world where Latang replaces him on PP1. You know what I mean? I think there's a okay. world where they both play there at some point. But I don't think Carlson is not going to play on power play one. And that that's the key to me. Um, obviously, I don't think that he is going to come near, like approach near his production that he had last year. Because I don't think his time on ice is going to be near as high. And I think they're going to probably want him to play a little bit more defense <laughs> if, if he's I even capable so. of doing that at this point. Um, but I, I think he I think he there's definitely potential for him to be point per game. Uh, and at 33, I, th- I really like that. I really like that okay. a lot. So, um, right. yeah, I think, I think book if, if I had to, ch- if I had to choose the two, I would fucking book it, baby. Um, and then Chris Letang though, I, I, I don't hate Letang though at that ADP either. So, uh, but I do feel a little bit more, uh, iffy about it, I would say. Okay. Uh, Washington. They were sixth in the Metro last year. They were kind of middle of the pack to bottom half in almost every statistical category. Um, Corsi, four percentage, scoring chances, four percentage, everything, five five save percentage, shooting percentage, just like really mediocre across the board. Uh, 16th in power play percentage, right in the middle. Uh, let's just dive into, into their goalies. 
Darcy Kemper had a 5v5 save percentage of 9-12 last year and a 68% start share, and that's with an injury. There was a stretch of time where Charlie Lindgren got a run, and uh, he was the hottest hottest goaltender in Kakupful scoring for about a month and then really stunk after that. Uh, he ended up with a 9-0-3 5v5 save percentage, but he's the backup again. Um, Kemper has an ADP of 138.44. I really like him in this spot. I think he'll get tons of starts, tons of shot volume. Um, I think Washington will be not the worst, but not great. Like, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs or anything, but I think they're still going to get wins. And I think Kemper is going to be a solid, solid goaltender for them and definitely a volume starter. So at that ADP, similar to Jari, I think I like Jari better, definitely. Uh, but Kemper is kind of, kind of, uh, he's another goalie that I would definitely consider taking in that range. So what, it, what what's your feel on the Washington situation here? I mean, this is definitely the, the sweet spot for your zero G candidates, right? Like the team is good, but not great. They're bad defensively, but not terrible. He has competition but there's no cemented track record of, of that competition being successful. Uh, schedule notes, they have 36 off night games, which is the third most in the league. So you're going to see him bleed those back-to-back -back starts. Uh, they have 15 back-to-backs, which is the second most in the league. And to further make his situation more volatile. They have seven weeks with one to two games and nine weeks with four to five games, which is slightly above average in both directions. So I don't think that he's going to get close to the 68% start share that he had in the previous season. I think it's going to be closer to 60, 40, maybe, you know, slightly a tick in the negative direction towards the fifties for that. So I don't think he's got such a stranglehold on the position based on how their schedule shakes out based on the success of Lingren and stretches last year. But just like Jari, this is where I begin to consider goalies. And just like Jari, I think there are a lot of boxes checked that are positive indicators for him to be a zero to hero. All right, buddy. Let's talk about some Washington skaters. So their top six on daily faceoff shakes out a little differently than a lot of people are projecting. Uh, they've got Kuznetsov on the top line with Ovechkin and Wilson, uh, just the way that they were two years ago. Uh, and then Sonny Milano with Backstrom and Oshie, Dylan Strom on the third line. I, I mean, the, the, the rhetoric that I've been hearing is that Dylan Strom is a lock with Ovechkin. And I just don't think that that's true. I think if you got like, you've got Kuznetsov that who is supposedly falling out of favor with the team because of his partying and they're trying to trade him, and he doesn't always they've try been, very hard. And they've been saying and, that for a long time. Yeah. I just am not sure that I believe that he's not going to get good deployment. Like I, 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 I feel like they have a new coach, first of all. Um, Laviolette is gone. They've got... Uh, I actually can't remember who they got. Who do they got? Now, now I got to look this up. I, um, but anyways, um, I yeah, I, I'm feeling pretty confident that you're going to see a bounce back from Kuznetsov. Uh, and Backstrom is still there too, man. He's got built-in chemistry with Ovi. I just don't know that Dylan Strom is the home run top line center that everyone says he's going to be. So um, this is this is really going to chap your ass when you realize who it is. Spencer Carberry. Oh yes, yeah. How did I not? How did I not remember that? I knew it was some assistant coach that was getting a. Get, <laughs> of course, it's the Leafs power play coach from last year. Um, yeah, apparently. All right. well, the youngest coach in the league. Oh, no, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. He's he's. I think he's going to be a pretty solid coach. Um, the first power play on daily faceoff. Uh, they're saying it's Tom Wilson, Nick Backstrom, Dylan Strom, Alex Ovechkin, John Carlson. I don't think that it's that far off. Again, like I could see Kuzi moving back up there. I don't know. We'll see. Um. But Tom Wilson as a net front, I think, makes sense. Ovi's always going to be there. Carlson's always going to be there. Um, 
But yeah, let's jump into these skaters. Let's find some value here. Let's try and finish this shit up. Alex Ovechkin. <laughs> Nate's got him for 48 goals, 87 points, 334 shots, 190 hits, 30 plus power play points. Uh, just a just a categories monster still at this stage in his career. Blake's got him for 46 goals, 86 points. His ADP is 17. 0.87. I think that's great value for Ovechkin. I think you could probably pick him even a little bit higher than that. I, there's an argument for him uh, in the early second round. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that's right around where you're, where you'd like him, and maybe you could pick him even a little sooner than that. John Carlson, Nate's got him for 17 goals, 72 points. Blake's got him for 16 and 63. His ADP is 45.32. Now, if he's closer to Nate's projection, I really like him at that ADP. I'm personally really high on Carlson. Uh, And honestly, like, okay, let's address the the keeping Carlson thing for a second. The whole Dom decision just absolutely lambasting Tore into him, dude. Tore into him. Really was, like, kind of a dick to him, honestly. Kind of a dick, Uh, yeah. And uh, I totally am on board with brian to be honest like i i like maybe not maybe i'm not taking john carlson over eric carlson but i am pretty high on him going into this year like i just don't see there being a big fall off for him uh i think the power play is yes the players are aging but i still don't think that they're going to be that bad I, I don't think that there's going to be a huge fall off here. So I'm not sure why Dom was so Dom seems so shocked that he had Carlson so high on his depth chart in terms of defensemen. So anyways, Brian, I got your back, buddy. Uh, Max Pacioretty uh, is next on this list uh, at an 82 game pace. So obviously he's going to be hurt for a little bit. We don't know when he's coming back, but 82 game pace. <laughs> Nate's got him for 36 goals, 64 points, 281 shots. Blake's got him for 34 goals, 62 points, 289 shots. His ADP right now on fan tracks is 157.16. I think I like that for Pacioretty. Um, I think that he's such a, he's such a, a you're shaking your head, but I, I, God no. if, if I think at this point you're taking swings on people, right? Okay. Pacioretty has been a productive player like very productive player, very high volume shooter, really great converter uh, will likely play on power play one when he's healthy. Um, and I just really, I really like him when he's healthy, okay. but that's the kicker. That's yes, the kicker when he's healthy. Right. But uh, at this range, I think uh, it's, it's an all right swing to take. I think it's a, it's a, one of the safer swings, but obviously I mean, you, uh, if his, his Achilles may pop again, you never know. <laughs> you, you just so, never know with those types of I don't things. even want to say stuff like that because uh, having a, your Achilles torn three times in a lifetime, that's just, that's not good. That's like, that's this too much. That's too much. Um, I agree with the sentiment of what you are saying in that if you want to take a lotto ticket, Max Pacioretty has phenomenal odds right like if he hits you hit the lotto right yeah but at an adp of 157 that is way too soon for me to be pulling a scratch off ticket right like i would so much rather have i i don't even know the actual adp but i'm just gonna say the name quentin byfield right like yeah that that feels like a range where I'm like, okay, I want to take a depth lotto ticket. I want to take Klingberg. I want to take Byfield. I want to take Arvidsson. I want to take Wallstrom. I want to, there's, there's so many names out there that I'm just pulling out of a hat right now where I'm like, I would rather bet on that player skyrocketing than Pacioretty being healthy, getting accustomed <laughs> to the system then skyrocketing like that's step sure. three in his yeah. process right so yeah. like the idea that he takes 280 plus shots next season i think is way less likely than he takes zero shots next season and like that's 
that's such a such a, a, a early point in the draft for me to do that. Like, I get where you're coming from, but there is zero fucking chance that I'm doing that. Zero. <laughs> so if yeah, you're I, in a draft I mean, with me fair. and you're like, is he going to snipe Pacioretty from me? The answer is now no. I know. Not gonna now I know. That's good. Uh, Tom Wilson, 25 goals, 53 points from Nate. Blake's got him for 27, 56. Uh, obviously gets a ton of hits, close to 250. Uh, and his ADP is 143.42. So in I love it. Bangers Cats, that's I great. would say that's really good. Uh, in points, really it's good. still pretty good. Like I think he's going to play top line, potentially top power play. Um, so I, I like that for Tom Wilson. He's healthy again, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, Dylan Strom, Nate's got him for 24 goals, 60 points. Blake's got him for 24 and 59. His ADP is 193.98. So, I mean, really, any of these centers – on on washington you don't have to pay anything for them like they're Mm -hmm. all going to be available at the end of your draft so take your pick whoever you think is going to get on that top line take your pick nate's got kuznetsov for 17 goals 59 points blake's got him for 18 and 56 he's even lower at 217 um and then backstrom even lower than that um and then the last player that we should touch on is Rasmus Sandin. Nate's got him for eight goals, 38 points. Blake's got him for nine goals, 45, ADP 202.77. I'm not really expecting him to have crazy deployment this year. Like, I think he's going to get a better opportunity, obviously, than in Toronto. But I don't think that he has as much upside as people are making it seem. Like he obviously he had that hot run when he got the power play when he came into Washington. Um, I'm just I'm not a hundred percent sold. But again, another guy that you don't have to spend any draft capital on. So if you want him as your bench defenseman, uh, I think he's a pretty good candidate for that. So um, yeah, all right. What what do you think? Who's your who's your value guy? I think I'm going with any of these centers. Probably like for me, it's Kuznetsov. Um, but I think any of those centers are probably pretty solid value. What do you think? I think the best value represented here for me is probably Carlson at the 45 ADP, right? I know yeah. Nate has highlighted him as a um, as a projections model star, right? Like there's immense value to be had for him um, getting drafted at 45. With that said, I don't have so much faith in him as the player as I do uh, the value over replacement at, at 45. I think that's a phenomenal place to get him like in the 20 to 30 range. No, thank you. Plus 40. I'm, I'm really big into it, but I think the absolute best value that you're going to get from this team is Tom Wilson. And that's predicated on him being healthy, obviously, but a 50 plus point player at right wing who is going to hit, almost as much as anyone in the league, right? At an ADP of 143 sounds absolutely amazing to me. And as somebody that generally tries to build my team this year from the right wing down, the idea that I'm going to be able to get another right winger on a team that has the third most off night games in the league, when every other right winger that I'm drafting is going to be pretty much cemented into the heavy nights is a big, big bonus for me. So I'm, I'm thinking about positional scarcity, scarcity and um, scarcity and building a lineup. When I say that Tom Wilson represents an immense value for me, but getting a starting right winger who fills categories, who is a stat stuffer at 140 plus and on a team that it plays a ton of off nights. I'm very excited about that. So um, my punt uh, is, uh, you know what? I said Rasmus Sandin. I'm not really sure about that, just because his ADP is so low. I, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with TJ Oshie. He's still being drafted somehow. Uh, and if anyone is, if anyone is competing for the most injury prone player on the team with Max Pacioretty, it's TJ Oshie. Um, <laughs> he just never seems to be healthy. And he's getting old. He's not going to get on the top power play. So I'm just, I just am completely off of Oshi. Um, last year we said, last year I said Anthony Mantha, you should punt him. You said Kuzi, uh, 
which you ended up being right about. I still think that there's some positive regression uh, potential here for Kuzi. Um, and I've actually got him as my sleeper or bounce back candidate, I guess you would say. Um, so I am, I, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm all in on Kuznetsov, but I'm higher than most people in the community are. I, I just, I just don't, I just don't buy that he's going to be a third line center on this team. It's crazy. I completely agree with that. I think the likelihood that he is a ADP 217 player is very, very low. It wouldn't shock me if he broke into the top 100 in terms of value at the end of the season. Like, who else is going to combat him for that backstrom? I seriously doubt it. So I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, for me, the punt is is absolutely Pacioretty until he's going 60 70 spots later and then even then i probably won't do it um although i i i feel like that's a cop out because that just seems obvious to me but maybe i'm a little broken <laughs> all right that's all we have for today we went a little longer again today sorry about that but uh we we're just so excited to talk fantasy hockey man it's hard to resist being long-winded all right Please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. This, again, I've said this before, but it's the most important time of the year for us to be on everyone's radar. And your reviews really help with that. Um, Our listenership has gone up quite a bit, and it's really exciting, but we just need everyone to review. Give us those five stars. I love five stars. They're the best. Uh, Also, if you like our content... (laughs) Check out the Apples and Genos Patreon to support us on a monthly basis. You can hop into the Apples and Genos Discord server. We're having lots of discussions about fantasy hockey in there. We're still running best ball leagues. Uh, You can get more information in the Discord about those. I believe best ball 22 is up right now. Uh, Join me in 22. There There you go. Let's do it. Uh, I think we're just going to keep rolling those until the season starts. Uh, oh, and yeah. shout outs to the shout outs to the band there there for providing our music. There's Spotify links in the episode description. Follow us on X. Binksy is at Binklemania. Nate is at Apples Genos. Blake is at Blake Creamer AG, and I'm at Just Josh in four one. Please practice safe stats and happy drafting. Have a good one, folks. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>